Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Osara and Lily here. And as always, I'd like to remind you, please stay safe and healthy and hit that notification bell, like, subscribe, and comment below. And today we are going to get back into Les Miserables. We're going to do the uh, summary and analysis to books 5 through 8 of of uh, the, the section uh, Fantine. And let's do that. Chapter 5, Degradation <clears throat> A mysterious stranger arrives in the town of Montreal, Surmer, with a small amount of capital and a few changes to production. He revolutionizes the local industry of glass bead making. Hi, Jamie. Making a fortune for himself. He donates the majority of his money to charity, establishing hosp uh, hospitals and schools. His first night in the village, he rushed into a burning building to save two children who turned out to be the sons of the police chief, so no one asks for his identity papers. He calls himself Pierre Madeline, but he was previously known as the convict John John. He dedicates himself to charity and justice, providing jobs to the poor and donating money to the needy throughout the district. Well, he, he was, you know, trying to make amends for... He's offered a position as mayor due to his great wealth and service and accepts when an elderly woman reminds him of all the good he can do with such a position. Not everyone accepts him. He is dogged by Jabber, a police officer's officer who thinks while John is not exactly who he seems to be. Jabber, who was born in a prison, has a rigid sense of justice. He does and a warped sense of justice, I think. He does not believe that people are truly capable of reform. He is not uh, quite certain that he recognizes Val John, who has skirted the law by hiding his identity as an ex-convict, but he watches him closely. One day, as an elderly man, Fock Eleven, is trapped when his horse carriage overturns and, and Monger Madeline rushes in to rescue him, Jabbert calmly remarks that in his whole life he has only seen one person that, with that kind of strength necessary to lift a cart. This man was a convict in the prison of Toulon. Monjur Madeline turns pale, but rushes in and saves the man anyway. Javert becomes more certain of the wealthy mayor's true identity. Meanwhile, Fantine returns to town and requires a job at a factory owned by Monjur Madeline, sending much of her paycheck to the Thenardiers for the care of Cassette. However, a nasty older woman decides to to figure out where Fantine is sending her money, so, you know, a busybody type. We get them. Uh, yeah, they still plenty of those people around. Uh, sending her money and uncovers Fantine's illegitimate daughter Cosette. This discovery prompts the Thenardiers to raise the cost of caring for Cosette and also results in Fantine getting fired from her factory job. Fantine takes a job mending shirts, making a tiny amount of money. She is forced to sell all her furniture and barely and barely eats and sleeps. The Thenardiers demand, demand money to buy medicine for Cosette, and Fantine sells her long blonde hair to provide it. The Thenardiers spend it on other things, because they didn't really need it for that. They were just asking for too much. In order to meet the increasing demands of the Thenardiers, Fantine sells several of her teeth, and she loses her, what she considers her beauty, I mean, her youth. They are ripped out of her head by a traveling dentist to be <coughs> made into dentures. When the Thenardiers demand 100 francs for the care of Cosette, Fantine resorts to prostitution. She suffers terribly in this profession. One night, on her rounds, a rude young man shoves snow down her low-cut dress. F Fantine launches herself into, at him, screaming at him. Scream, scratching his face and screaming. Javid appears just in time to witness this, a prostitute assaulting a citizen, and he drags her back to the police station. You know, like I said, whoops, sense of justice. She begs for mercy, trying to explain her situation and her need to provide a life for her little daughter. Javid is unmoved and, senses, and sentences her to six months imprisonment. Fantine weeps despairingly. At this moment, Monsieur Madeline walks in the door. Fantine is complete, in complete despair and confusion, blames him for the present predicament, and spits in his face. 
Madeline calmly wipes off her spit and tells the stunned Javit that she is to go free. Javit protests that she has committed an awful crime, but Madeline uses this power as mayor to overrule him. Fantine, amazed, blurts out her life. Story to Monsieur Madeline. He tells her that he'll provide her with a living stipend and reunite her with her daughter. Overwhelmed, Fantine fades. Chapter 6, Javert's. Fantine is moved to the infirmary. She has developed a terrible cough from the snowball incident, and she is running a high fever. Probably has pneumonia. Poor thing. A gentle nun named Sister Simply took looks after her lovingly, and Monjur Madeline checks on her regularly. He sends great sums of money to the Thenardiers, asks them to use it to bring Cosette to her mother. However, they merely pocket it and ask for more, reluctant to give up a child who is bringing in so much money. The next day, Javert confronts Madeline, offering his resignation. Javert explains that he has informed the authorities that Monsieur Madeline is the ex-convert Jean Valjean in disguise. However, Javert was told that Valjean was recently arrested in the town of Errors. Javert is disgusted with his mistake and has decided that he will resign from the police force. Madeline, who, as the reader knows, is truly Jean Valjean, is stunned at this knowledge and asks more about the re <coughs> recent arrest. Jabbert <clears throat> explains that a man named Champ Matthew was arrested for stealing apples, which is a minor crime in and of itself. However, Champ Matthew bears a strong physical res resemblance to John Valjean. They are all the same age and from the same hometown and share similar names. Valjean's mother's maiden name was Matthew. One police after officer has testified that Champ Matthew is actually Valjean. Having informed Millinger and Ma Madeline of the situation, ja Javert steps out. Chapter 7, The Champ Matthew Affair Madeline Valjean is caught in a terrible conundrum. If Champ Matthew is, a, is an ex-convert convict, he will receive a heavier prison sentence for his theft. In addition to, be, to the punishment of his, he faces for skipping out on parole, Valjean has mysteriously disappeared from the authorities. Monsieur Madeleine, the true Valjean, is caught in a conundrum. On one hand, he has refer, uh, formed his life becoming a respected member of society and renouncing all criminal activity. Champ Matthew, on the other hand, did commit the crime of stealing apples. However, if Valjean is silent, an innocent man will be condemned to imprisonment. Valjean, Ma John Valjean does not want to return to the nightmare of imprisonment, but he does not want someone else to do to be forced to suffer in his place. He has, you know. Valjean paces and ponders until late in the night. He also knows that if he turns himself in, all the prosperity and charity is created in the region will come to an end, and poor Fantine will never be reunited with her daughter. But he cannot live with himself if all these good things are built on the condemnation of an innocent man, desperate to hide his true identity as Valjean. He throws Bishop Muriel's candlesticks into the fire, but a mysterious voice urges him to do what he knows is right. After a short sleep plagued by uneasy dreams, Valjean boards a carriage that will take him to Arras in the trial of Champ Matthew. Valjean is relieved when an axle in his carriage breaks. Maybe this is God telling him he doesn't have to turn himself in. Maybe this is a sign that he can remain free. This hope is dashed when a young boy arrives to tell him that another carriage is available. Back in Montreal's sermon, Fantine's fever worsens, worsens and she calls out for Monger Madeline and her child. Sis, Sister Simply tells her that Monger Madeline has gone out of town. Fantine becomes calmer, assuming that he is going to find her daughter. Monger Madeline arrives rather late to the town of Errors, despite his hopes that he has missed the trial of Champ Matthew. He arrives in the courthouse of the, to discover that it is still in progress. Monger Madeline struck by the surreal light. Surreal sight, excuse me. Champ Matthew does look exactly like him, 
and the scene in the courtroom is the per perfect mirror of the one that Madeline Valjean faced to so many years ago. Champ Matthew tries in vain to argue his innocence, but his rough speech and confusion does not win him the sympathy of the jury. Witnesses are brought in fellow prison. Witnesses are brought in fellow prisoners testify that this is truly Jean Valjean, a dangerous repeat offender. Just as the ju just as the judge is about to pronounce the sentence, Madeleine Valjean stands up and proclaims his true identity. He is the ex-convict Jean Valjean. The judge immediately asks if there is a doctor present to escort this the esteemed mayor home, since he deems seems to be in a state of confusion, but. Valjean argues his case persuasively, identifying details about how about his fellow prisoners, scars and tattoos, and only one of their intimates would know. The court is completely stunned, and no one stops Valjean, and he walks out of the courtroom. Champ Matthew is quitted and released. Chapter eight Counterstrike. Upon the return to Montreal Sermer, John Valjean goes to the hospital to visit Fantine and discovers that his hair has turned completely white. He also learned that Fantine is extremely ill, remains alive only out of the anticipation of seeing her daughter. Fantine walks briefly from a, wakes briefly from a fevered sleep to ask about her daughter. Valjean lies to her, saying that Cosette is here, and Fantine must regain her strength a bit before she's allowed to see her. Fantine rhapsodizes to Valjean about the joy of her upcoming reunion with her daughter until they are surprised by the sudden appearance of Javert. Javert has been ordered to take Monsieur Madeleine, the true Jean Valjean, into police custody. Javert feels that he has been vindicated in doing a noble act by stamping out crime. Jean Valjean begs Javert to give him three days to retrieve Fantine's child, after which he will submit willingly to arrest. Fantine cries out in protest when Javert refuses this, and Javert snaps at her, explaining that Monsieur Madeleine is really a convict. Fantine dies from the shock of this revelation, not to mention the horrible things he was calling her. <laughs> Javert takes Valjean to the local prison. However, that very night, Valjean's servant is stunned by his sudden appearance in his former home. He explains that he has broken out of prison and asks the servant to fetch Sister Simplice the nun who held care who took care who had cared for Fantine. Valjean gives her a note explaining that he has set funds aside for the burial of Fantine. Javert comes excuse me. Javert comes up the stairs, puzzled at the light in Valjean's old room. Valjean conceals himself and Sister Simplice confronts the police officer. Javert asks her if she has been an escape seen an escaped prisoner. A, prison, a man named John Valjean, Sister Simplice, who has never told a lie in her life, no matter how dire the situation, says she is alone in the room and has not seen Valjean. Javert accepts this and disappears, and Valjean sets off through the woods. Well, I mean, you know, she could say she's not seen John, John Valjean. To her, he's not John Valjean. So. The uh, analysis. During the, his new life in Montreal Sermer, Valjean adapts the name of a famous penitent, Mary Magdalene, long believed to have been a prostitute redeemed by Jesus. Hey, I like that. Mary Magdalene was said to have abandoned her sinful life to become a, one of Jesus' most loyal followers. In the same way, Valjean sets aside his past life as an ex-convict to become a respected business, businessman who spreads charity everywhere. Still, this new life would not have been possible without a chance accident. Valjean's rescue of the police chief's children and his continuous obscuration of his true identity. Valjean must take a make a decision between hiding his identity and preserving his new virtuous life. When he learns that the man Champ Matthew has been mistaken for, for himself, Champ Matthew may well, go to prison because the authorities think that he is Valjean. Champ Matthew may, um, excuse me. Valjean agonizes over this decision for a long time. Not all of his reasons for wishing to keep quiet are selfish. He is afraid that Montreal Sermer will fall back into poverty in his absence. He is eventually 
does testify for Chap Matthew, though he continually hopes that he will pre pre be prevented by chance from doing this thing he that he does not wish to do. Fantine embodies the horrible effects of poverty. Over the course of her stories, Fantine gradually loses everything she holds dear. Her Parisian life, her lover, her daughter, her beautiful teeth and hair, her dignity, her life. Author Victor Hugo frames Fantine's choice to enter prostitution as a negative thing, but emphasizes that the true fault lies with a society that deprives women of honest employment. Hugo maintains that prostitution is the product of poverty and capitalism. This section also introduces the reader to the characters of Javert, the primary antagonist of the book. Les Miserables is concerned with the development of the human soul, but this divine ascension may not always have a great deal in common with earthly success or even society's ideas of justice. Javert is a paragon of justice, but he is unsympathetic. He has no sense of mercy. I mean, we, we read, uh, what was that, St. Thomas. So uh, justice without mercy mercy and compassion is not, well, it's not really just. That's not the, it's better to have empathy. Javid is, okay. Fantine, despite her need to provide for her daughter. Okay, well done. Javid is a paragon of justice, but he is unsympathetic. He has no sense of mercy, indicating by his quickness to punish Fantine, despite her need to provide for her daughter. He is nearly a character so fixated that he is so on on unrealistic notions of right and wrong. And when we had uh, read St. Thomas, we discussed the difference between justice and compassion. And, and, com and saying compassion is, is better than justice. I mean, how do I get that? Um, the thing about John Valjean is, granted, he... I don't, he wasn't as dangerous as they made him out to be. First, he stole a loaf of bread to feed his family who was starving to death. And then, I mean, then he, well, I mean, he did take the candlesticks of father. I mean, that was through frustration, not to say that it was right, but it, it didn't endanger anybody. And then, then the other bishop had told them they gave him to him, so they let him go. And then the next thing he did afterwards, which is, you know, not a great thing. He, he put his foot on that uh, little chimney sweeps coin. <laughs> Nowadays, that wouldn't be considered highway robbery. I mean, that's not highway robbery. Back then, they had different ideas. But So, I mean, he really wasn't a bad man. And their idea of justice was just a little, little off. So in their case, with Fantine and... John Valjean, I think that's where empathy came before what they considered true justice. I mean, everything is exactly a, has to be stamped, but you got to have a little bit of empathy too. I mean, there are situations you got to weigh the situation, and that society definitely did not weigh the situations. But anyway, I'll get into a little bit of the next section. Cosette in book one and Cosette. Let's see how far. Book one, Cosette, Waterloo. I'll just I'll will start the uh, first subsection. It says uh, what you see on the way from Nivelles, on a beautiful morning on May of last year, eighteen sixty one, a traveler, the author of this story, was going from Nivelles toward La Hope. He was traveling on foot between two rows of trees. He was following a wide paved road, sneaking across hills that one after the other, lifted up and let it drop again, like enormous waves. He had passed the Lillois and Boy Signor Isaac to the west. He saw the slate roof steeple of Rain La Allard, which takes the form of an inverted base. He had just passed a wooded hill, and at the corner of a crossroad, beside a sort of worm eaten signpost bearing the inscription, Former Tollgate, number four, a tavern with this sign, the Four Winds, Ekabo Private Cafe, half a mile behind this tavern. He reached a little valley where a stream flowed under an arch dug into the embankment of the road. The cluster of trees, widely spaced but very green. 
That fills the bale on one side of the road, spreads out, spreads out on the other side into meadows, and sweeps away in graceful disarray toward Brain La Alud. On the right and besides the road, beside the road there was an inn, with a four-wheeled cart in front of the door, a large bundle of stakes for hot plants, a plow, a pile of dry brush near a live hedge, some lime smoking in a square hole in the ground, and a ladder lying next to an old shed with man with mangers for straw. A young girl was digging up weeds in a field where a large yellow poster, probably for traveling, show at some annual fair. That's, that's probably going to be Cosette. Was fluttering in the wind at the corner of the, the end beside a pond in which the a flotilla of ducks was navigating. A rough footpath disappeared into the brush. The traveler took this path. After a hundred paces passing a 1500th 15, 15th century wall topped by a steeple gable of crossed bricks, he found himself opposite a huge stone doorway, its arch springing from rect rectilinear imposts. In, in the solemn style of Louis the Fourteenth, with plain medallions on the sides, over the entrance was a severe facade, and a wall perpendicular to the facade almost touched the doorway. Flanking it at an, an abrupt right angle, on the meadow in front of the door lay three harrows, through which were blooming as be best they could all the flowers of May. The entrance was closed; it was shut by a decrepit double door, decorated with an old rusty knocker. The sunshine was enchanting. The branches of the tree had that gentle tremor of May that seems to come from the birds. Nests more than from the wind. A hardy little bird, probably in love, was des desperately singing away in a tall tree. The traveler paused and examined in the stone at the left of the door near the ground. A large circular excavation like the hollow of a sphere. Just then the door opened and a peasant woman came out. She saw the traveler and noticed what he was examining. A French cannonball did that, she said. And she added, what did you, what you see there, higher up in the door near a nail, is the hole made by a Biscay musket. The bullet did not go through the wood. What's the name of this place, asked the traveler. Hugmont, said the woman, answered. The traveler straightened up. He took a few steps and looked over the hedges. On the horizon, he could see through the trees a sort of hillock on this hill, hillock, something in the distance that looked like a lion. He was on the battlefield of Lo the Waterloo. Let's see, I'm going to... Stop there. The next subsection is fairly long, not too, too long. Um, the next subsection will be Hugamont, but we're going to stop there. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, and comment below. And also hit the notification bell. And stay tuned for more from Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Till then, from Jamie and Lily and Ostara.